Today on Coding 101, we speak with Liam Kennedy, the inventor of ISS Above. It's time to get coding. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Coding 101 is brought to you by Lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,000 high-quality online courses and training videos, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit Lynda.com slash C101. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash C101. Welcome to Coding 101. It's the Twitch show where we show you the secrets of the Code Monkey. I'm Father Robert Ballaser. And I'm Shannon Morse. And today we have some really interesting, fun stuff happening. And it's a little bit different for anybody watching the stream right now. It's a little different, so don't freak out. We are actually sitting in the living room set because we have an interview today. So we just finished our C Sharp module. We did, uh, was it eight episodes, I believe? Eight, eight episodes, episodes of C Sharp. So we did eight episodes of our C Sharp module, and we went through everything from beginning to some crazy advanced stuff. And today, since we're going to be moving to a different module in two weeks, we decided to break it up with a really cool interview from somebody that we know in the tech sphere that knows a little bit about some code and what you can do once you become a true advanced code monkey. That's so. right, folks. Now, remember, when we created this show, we thought we didn't want to just jump from one language to another. No, that's right. not. Nubs and I met and we said, look, we got to give them a chance to recover. Give them a chance to, to, to step back from that coding ledge and maybe look at a couple of people who have successfully turned code into something wonderful, which is why I am so happy to welcome to the show Mr. Liam Kennedy. Liam, thank you so much for coming up. Thank you for inviting me. Now, you're from Pasadena, right? I am, yes. I'm the little old colder, uh, coder, coder in, from, uh, Pasadena. from Pasadena, yeah. yeah so, uh, the home of the Big Bang Theory. The home of the Big Bang Theory, and yes, if you sort of look at uh, what I've got going on here in front of me and imagine my house, uh, <laughs> we've pretty much been living in the Big Bang Theory in my house for the last three months. Now, Liam, before we get into the wonderful hardware that's in front of us, could you just give the Twit Army, the, the Coding 101 Code Monkeys, a little idea of who you are, where you come from, and, and why you're standing in front of the ISS above? Sure. So, uh, firstly, so the ISS above, obviously, what it does is, uh, on the basics of it, it just lights up whenever the space station is around, which happens more frequently than you'd imagine. But uh, my interest in, in the ISS is really what brought me to develop this. So uh, for many years, I've been passionate about public outreach for astronomy. Oh, and cool. a me common, too. yeah, there you go. <laughs> and a common thing that I would always get involved in is looking out for when the space station is coming over. Because, you know, the public just really love to be surprised by things that they didn't realize that was there. And many people just don't realize it's, uh, it's actually around. Now, you mentioned to me previously that you can actually see the space station come over, like, especially at night when the sun's reflecting off of it, about every 90 minutes or so, according to gravity, at least. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it comes over, uh, it, it really covers 90% of the world's population wow. uh, every day. And that's because it's in its orbit spinning around at 17,000 miles an hour, about 260 miles up, and the Earth spins underneath it. Yeah. If you imagine, that's what's really going really on. Fast. So it, it yeah. sort of, it covers a lot of ground. Um, but so that, that sort of gives you an idea of, of what my interest in the space station and then how I, I then came to you know, do this development. So I have been a developer for many years. So, you know, I started out on the Sinclair ZX81. Um, wow. and I think I destroyed it when I tried <laughs> to solder it together. Well, that's what we love, right? Right. Here, so, here on the show, Shad and I are always talking about if you like something, if you really want to play with it, get in there, see what makes it work, and break a few things. Break it, yes. Yeah. Thankfully, I haven't broken too many of these so far, <laughs> but I have tried to. Um, so, so my history is sort of somewhat as a developer and a hacker, and up until this project, 
I was I would have called myself a .NET developer. Uh, okay. okay. So you know that was my street cred was you know working in that environment, and then the opportunity came up to look at this project, and uh, Python was the way to go. So I very quickly sort of got into that mode of working. So do you have a pretty good experience with not only Python, but C Sharp and C++ and Java and all those different ones? Yes, I do. Um, but I would really classify myself as someone who is um, self-trained. Ah, okay. So I, I didn't do a lot of this in college. I, I mostly learned what I learned by just getting involved in the first computers that were available for home, for home use and then programming it. I actually so. really like to hear that because one of the things that we've run into a lot is our audience is mixed. We have people who mm -hmm. have never coded before. And we have people who have been coding for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. and, and you know this. Programmers get incredibly protective about their language, their way of learning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's true. When I was teaching programming, there, there was always a curriculum. There was always step one, step two, step three, step four. I think Shannon and I have been trying to do something different. We've, mm -hmm. we've been trying to give people interesting projects, give them the, the, the little steps forward, and let them go out and actually figure out how it works. Yes, exactly. It, it sounds to me that your lineage is more of that, that second it, way of doing it. It, it really is. And, and when I go back to thinking how I started out creating this code, um, I start out just by actually trying out little things and seeing if I can get a little bit working first and then build on that. So rather than coming at a project thinking, well, this is what I've got to get the whole thing to do in the end. Because firstly, it's just too big a, you know, a, too big a, a problem to tackle. Right. So I just, I just take on little bits and get them working. And then I get some good feedback, sort of, yay, yeah, yeah, I got that working. And then I can just <laughs> move on from there. The disadvantage, though, I potentially, is if you look at my code, uh, it's the most embarrassing code around. <laughs> yes. Because yes. It, it contains workarounds for problems that I encountered while I was developing in that mode. And then, you know, it turned out to be other problems. So if you look at the code, you'll see comments about, you know, what went wrong and, oh, I've tried to fix it by doing this. So that, that's, that's my programming style. Well, I it's think we'll embarrassing. be taking a bit of a look at your code later, I think shall so. we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you know, it, it, I understand this. If, if you sit down and you map everything out with your team and you're all responsible for modules, yeah, you, you really do need to adhere to certain principles to make sure that everyone's code is going to interact properly. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're the hacker and you're sitting in a garage and you're like, hey, you know what? I'm going to make this light blink. Oh, it blinks? Now I'm going to make that sound port turn on. Now I'm going to activate mm -hmm. this I.O. I think it's actually acceptable. In fact, mm -hmm. it's preferred to have spaghetti code. I mean, you <laughs> understand. Code. I mean, we all know. We know that. We know how this works, right? <laughs> it's just just getting it to work. That that first feeling of uh, we call it yatta. Mm -hmm. You know, oh well, look at that. It, 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 it's cool. But l let me ask you this: When you are developing a project like ISS above, do you just try to break down real world problems into the little pieces that can be solved by code? I mean, how how do you go about? moving from, I like the ISS, I like space exploration, mm -hmm. to I'm going to make a Raspberry Pi program that can tell me when it's above me. Uh, yeah, so I'll go back three years. Uh, I think this bears mentioning. Um, three years ago, I heard about a project, another project called ISS Notify, that was um, going to create a little Arduino-based device that would light up whenever the space station comes over. And I backed it along with quite a few other people. And after seeing a lot of great progress by the creator for a couple of years, mm -hmm. then it just looked like things just stopped happening. So, and there's, you know, you can speculate as to why that happened, but uh, the end result Sometimes is, it happens. yeah. So three years and I didn't have this cool little device that l lit up when the space station came by. So I just really just gave up waiting and decided to see what I could create. And thankfully, you know, in the, uh, you know, in the time that elapsed from then to now, uh, we ended up, uh, you know, building the Raspberry Pi version. Now, uh, I never knew really about the Raspberry Pi seriously until October of last year, although it's been around for several years before yeah. then, and it's British. 
Oh, really? As well, yes, right. it was Evidently. developed mm -hmm. by, yeah. So uh, with a name like that, it should be, <laughs> right? Um, so, and I started to look at the Raspberry Pi actually for a different reason. Uh, I do uh, video streaming and, and uh, web shows a little bit like this, not really, um, <laughs> but with Bill Nye, the science guy and things, and I needed oh. a way to play out videos. And one of the uh, users of uh, the switcher that I, that I use actually showed a video of how they created a video playout system using the Raspberry Pi. I bought one to look to see whether I could use it for that. When I got it, I was blown away with just how flexible mm -hmm. the Raspberry Pi platform was. And I decided to, it, it was just like the two things came together. Me being fed up with not having, you know, uh, a little device that lit up when the space station was coming over because I, you know, wanted to get that. And here's a Raspberry Pi. I just decided to take a look and very quickly found out that I could actually do things with it, um, you know, beyond what I thought was going to be possible. Now, I know that the original ISS Above project was, wasn't based on a Pi, it was based on an Arduino, mm -hmm. uh, which might explain some of the difficulties they had in getting it to work right. You know, that you always have to balance the, the capabilities of the platform with what you're trying to make it do. But even though the Pi is a wonderful device, we use it here on Know How, our, our mm -hmm. DIY show all the time. It's, it's a great, inexpensive device that really gets you to, to, to hack, to get you to program, gets you to play with what's possible. Why would you choose the Pi over anything else? Was it just convenience? Was it just because you already had one for this other project? Um, so I would say it, it was a matter of coincidence that, that I happened to have the Raspberry Pi in front of me. But I did some very quick testing of what I needed my code to do, and it's perfectly adequate for it. Absolutely. Um, you know, the other project, uh, I believe the way it was going to work was pull information every few days off the web from uh, some websites out there that list the same data. Oh, right. But my code actually does all of the calculations for where the ISS is on the device. Uh, there's, there's basically a standard library you can get called FM. It's spelled E-P-H-E-M for ephemeris, it's an astronomical term. <laughs> um, but, and I use that to do the calculations on the device, and it works just great. Wait, 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 wait. So I was under the impression that your project scraped some sort of publicly av available database to say, oh yeah, it's, it's over your latitude and longitude. You're saying mm -hmm. the Pi would know just because of the calculations you've programmed it. Yeah, I tell you, if, uh, if I didn't need the access to the internet for the clock, you could just unplug it from the internet and it would just work perfectly well. What it does pull down um, every few days is what's called the NASA two-line element. It's actually basically a set of data points that defines the orbit. Oh. And NASA updates that every few days. Uh, they probably update it minute by minute. But they, you know, the ISS shifts its position. Right. It, usually it's dropping down naturally because right. although it's up in space, it's still um, impacted a little bit by the upper atmosphere. Yeah. So it, it tends to drag itself back down, and then they use rockets to they, push yeah, it back up use, again. Oh, so use capsule to push it back up into its proper yeah. orbit. So the equation has to be updated. So that's what this, uh, the, the Raspberry Pi does use the internet for, is to pull down that information every few days. Wow. Now that's it, a lot of information for it to yeah. pull down. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it, yeah. Uh, it, mm -hmm. What, why would you take that approach? I mean, because my first inkling would be to reach out to NASA and say, if, if you're offering data of where the, the, uh, the station is orbiting, I'm going to scrape your publicly available feed mm -hmm. and just match that up with a location selection inside the UI. Instead, you decided to bake the calculations into the Pi mm -hmm. with that external variable of, okay, well, what have they done to orbit adjustment? Yeah. Well, there were several reasons. The most important one to me was that I did want this to be something that eventually I could put a real-time clock on it. Oh. And, then, and then it would only need infrequent connection to the internet to actually pull that information. The other thing is uh, the main site where people get the data for where the ISS is for their location, it's mm -hmm. actually a site called heavens-above.com. And that site 
has been crashing because oh. of the number of apps, mostly on smartphones, that do exactly what you say. Right. They, do, they didn't publish an API, so the way that every developer has done it is to do right. exactly what you, what you say. But unfortunately, it, get, it puts a hit on their server uh, in fact, I don't Apparently know if they've still got it now. there, but yeah. they actually had... It's up, it's up at the moment, but mm -hmm. yet you're right, because this puts you at the mercy of a server that you have no control yeah, over. Yeah, you don't it, want it to depend on an external source. Yeah. yeah, if they go down, your product doesn't work anymore. And also, I had an experience of this, because I my first app that I ever developed for a phone was for a Windows phone, and oh. it's called Look Up Tonight. Oh, cool. And it does really this and more, but what it's really doing is exactly that. It's pulling the data from heavens above and then displaying it on the, uh, you know, on the smartphone. And they changed the page. Oh. And of course, oops, the code broke. And then I had to yeah. completely, Surprise. you know, I had to update the app and then release it to the marketplace again. And it Reminds you know, me of, uh, of every Twitter app that I ever tried to run. <laughs> it would work until Twitter did change the API and suddenly, oh, nope, mm -hmm. change. Actually, have you ever met our chat room? Wonderful people. We've got people in the chat room who actually, they, they're impressed. They understand what you're trying to do. We have Eric Duckman and Bevo who are both saying, look, the, the calculations to do that, the number crunching was that, you, that you have mm -hmm. to make your pie do in order to figure out the orbit, yeah. that's not trivial. Mm -hmm. that's, that's actually a lot of work. It, it is, and um, I am not a rocket scientist. <laughs> so I, don't, I really couldn't do that math. But this library that you can get, it's just you install it with one line. You've you know, seen it, sudo, whatever it is, mm -hmm. apt get, blah, blah, or pip python install, whatever it is. Oh. I've forgotten it all. And then there's the FM library. And then you can then start coding against that yourself. And of, of course, the code is visible for anyone to see. You can look at what I've done. OK, so, so you had this code figured out all this the mathematical equations to find the mm -hmm. ISS above you at a certain time. Yes. And you figured out that you can put this on a Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. What's next? Uh, well, what's next was uh, just figuring out how I could uh, use the Raspberry Pi display options to you know indicate what's ah, going yes. on. And that's really what you see in front of you here. That's There's, why we have these LEDs blinking. Yeah. <laughs> so I've, uh, I've always uh, enjoyed anything with a blinking light. Well, let, um, you know what, yeah, let's get into the hardware. Because yeah. our, our, our guys love hardware. Mm -hmm. and, and we've got all these wonderful boxes sitting in front of us. Tell us, what are they doing? So, uh, yeah, so where do I start? Um, I'll start with this one that, that is just uh, very easy to look at, right? Oh, maybe I'll go over here. Depending. Oh, there, here we go. So, so this is this is the basic one with the Raspberry Pi platform, and it simply has a very simple display on it uh, called a Pi Glow. It's just um, a shield, right? It plugs right into yeah, the GPIO. Yeah, it plugs into the the yeah. GPIO port, and in fact, you can even see that I haven't put it in very nicely there. <laughs> um, but that's uh, that's all it is, and uh, then I just program the light to do a certain sequence based on where the space station is. Ah, you know this, and this is another version. This is with so that one's blinking. Yeah, and this one, if you count the number of green flashes, let's see if it's going to do it. About one, three. two. Okay. Oh, four, five, six, six. six. Okay, so. <laughs> Um, if it's approximately an hour or less, um, oh, okay. the ISS above flashes green the number of times for the number of 10 minute intervals. Oh, Perfect. So okay. now I have messed around with the time on these, so I'm not sure if this is real time now. <laughs> um, I don't think it is. Uh, but uh, so essentially that says it's, it's up to 60 minutes away for the, from the next pass of oh, the cool. ISS. So, and, you know, not all the passes are visible. Um, but, uh, and that's why I've got another website. So the other thing I've got going on here, you, you know, you, you were talking about just the Raspberry Pi being underpowered. Well, right. just think of this, this thing tweets. So when the <laughs> space station is uh, going, uh, is particularly close to you, um, all of the lights on here really start going crazy. But it also sends a tweet. So I could program it to say, oh, the, the ISS is above me. 
Yes. Does it tweet to the ISS? Well, yeah, it sort of. It tweets Ooh. to the ISS by tagging right. um, at the request of NASA. So during the Kickstarter program, they got wind of what was going on, and their public affairs coordinator at NASA Johnson Space Center, which is mission control for ISS, mm -hmm. sent me an email saying, could you please make sure that you tag at NASA oh, underscore Johnson? That's great. So that was neat. Um, the, they also do tweet to at ISS underscore research, cool. which is uh, the research arm. They're the, they're the organization for NASA that actually determines what research is done on the space station by oh, the astronauts. Wow. So they're receiving thousands of tweets from all your pies saying, but, hey, I, mm -hmm. I, I see your ISS. Well, yeah, and that, that gives it, that's, that's a good point. So I, I've run a Kickstarter that was very successful, but before that, I, I wanted to make absolutely certain that people wanted this and also that they could see that it was working oh, yeah. already. So, absolutely. you know, bearing in mind the other Kickstarter didn't fulfill its, uh, you know, what it was gonna, gonna do. Wait, so what? I so, so I created a, a beta program oh. and uh, I was heading over to the UK in December and I installed a couple of them in my grandkids. Uh, so the grandkids <laughs> got them. And then uh, there was a post on Hackaday and on uh, Reddit. And then people suddenly started to approach me saying, hey, can I get in on this beta program? Wow. So I had about 20 sites. So what you're seeing right here now are the tweets. Uh, so I'm just on my, uh, on my page here. You'll actually see the tweets that are coming from those beta right. sites that are around the world. Nice. That's so cool. And the way it's done is this little device is posting to my WordPress site. And the WordPress site is sending the tweet. Oh. What I like about this is you're, re you're leveraging a lot of existing tools mm -hmm. to do something that's very different. And that's very much in the hacker spirit. Now, Liam, uh, we want to come back to this. We want to talk all about mm -hmm. your Kickstarter because I know there's people out there who are wondering how they create their own successful Kickstarter, and yours, by any measure, was immensely successful. We also want to look at some of this other hardware. You showed us some of the finished product, you know, a Raspberry Pi with a, a mm -hmm. LED shield, something in a nice finished enclosure. You've got some interesting projects on this table over here that I think they'd be interested to see. But before that, I want to take just a moment to thank our sponsor. Now, you know them, you love them. They've been with us since the beginning of Coding 101. They're Linda. Now, what is Linda? Quite simply, Linda is how you learn online. Now, Linda is an online learning company that can help anyone learn creative, software, and business skills to achieve both personal and professional goals. With a Lynda.com subscription, members receive unlimited access to a vast library of current and engaging video tutorials across a wide variety of subjects. Everything from creative and software skills to business negotiation and programming. At lynda.com, you'll learn how to code, create, and build applications from the foundations of object-oriented programming in C and C++ to desktop and mobile apps for today's popular operating systems. You'll explore the fundamentals of programming, building web applications with .NET, PHP, and MySQL, managing data with SQL databases, connecting to cloud services, and much more. Now, we love Linda because we understand that with Coding 101, we're not giving you all the steps. We're not giving you all the knowledge. You're not going to finish an eight-week module and say, oh, well, now I know how to program. Now I know what C Sharp is. That's why you need something like Linda, which will guide you through the steps, which will teach you the correct way to program, which will give you all the information that we can't give you each and every week of Coding 101. Linda.com lets you improve your skills, learn new software, and keep up with technology with over 2,000 courses with more added daily. Their popular courses right now include Foundations of Programming, HTML, PHP with MySQL, Objective-C, Java, JavaScript, and WordPress. Their instructors are working professionals at the top of their fields, and they're all expert teachers. And those two don't necessarily go together, but Linda has gathered together the staff, the faculty, to make sure that they have competent teachers who know how to present the information. Linda has high quality video productions from state of the art studios. These aren't your homemade videos that you'll find on YouTube, although we love YouTube. I mean, heck, we're on YouTube. There is something to be said about using good video and good lighting and good audio because it doesn't matter how wonderful the knowledge is. If you can't stand the sound or the video, you're not gonna watch it. Linda also offers you curated course content. 
Each Lynda.com course is carefully structured so that users can learn from start to finish or jump to a specific chapter. They have easy to follow videos that can help you find the answers that you need and searchable transcripts that even let you search within a video to save you time and find exactly what you're looking for. No more scanning through a video to find some random piece of information that comes 15 seconds into the fourth season. No, 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 no. You can search for exactly what you're looking for and find the answers you need right now. They have courses for all experience levels from beginner, intermediate and advanced, covering a wide range of technical skills, creative techniques, business strategies and oh so much more. You can watch from your computer, your tablet or your mobile device and Linda even lets you switch and pick up the chapter where you left off from device to device. In other words, you get to learn at your own pace, on your own time, on your own schedule when you want to. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try lynda.com. It's only $25 a month for access to Lynda's entire course library. Or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's projects using the exact same assets. And you can try lynda.com free right now with a seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash c101 to access the entire library. That's over 2,000 courses free for seven days. That's lynda.com slash C101. And we thank Linda for their support of Coding 101. Now, Guys, <gasps> oh, high glow blinking, is making <laughs> blinking, lights. Blinking, blinking. What's going on? Uh, this, this thinks it's 12.30 p.m. Oh. So, so it thinks it's flashing. It thinks it's 12.30 p.m. So it is, uh, yeah, this is what it what it does when the space station is getting closer. Oh, that is so cool. it starts off going slow, but then as it as the space station gets closer to you and higher up in the sky, um, it then goes crazy wild. It goes nuclear. That yes. is awesome. Or nuclear. And uh, I well, forgot it's very to, noticeable. <laughs> a really great companion to this is a is a little app. If you have a an i uh, an iOS device. Oh, There's yeah. an app called Solar Walk, and this is uh, this is it right here. Wait a minute! I think I saw this in a movie. <laughs> yeah, almost. Yeah, I did the uh, animation for Gravity. No, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> not really. Um, so this is real time, and this is actually showing it uh, as it's coming. Uh, there we go. That's exactly, <laughs> oh, no! see, that's exactly what I thought this was going to be. There we go. <laughs> this is why you need ISS above. It will tell you where the space junk is. <laughs> so we had seen the ISS above California just a little bit earlier, maybe half an hour ago, and now it's over an ocean. Yeah, so it is, uh, so it is almost an, uh, it, I think it was a little bit longer than, than you're probably remembering, because I've been talking for so long. Our TD is <laughs> enjoying space. There, you know, but, we, if you if you talk about space in a room full of geeks, everything's going to come out. This, where is it now? Can is you see? That's the Aleutian Islands, I think. That's the oh. chain of. Uh, so I can zoom way out. Oh, there we go. Oh, and okay. you can see it's. Oh wow! It even shows the new Aleutian, orbits. Did I get that right? Now what are oh, those? That's what, where what it's are those going? Other it's going dots? the other way around. I've got it going. I'm all upside down. Uh, those are other spacecraft? I should be, yes, those are other um, satellites. Wow. Um, That's incredible. And, yeah, you look at this, you think, oh yeah, of course gravity, they were you know, going from the space station to the shuttle to the, uh, yeah. when you see this, but they're in, they're in, they're the in different, uh, different orbits. Different <laughs> orbits. Uh, and, and the best star, right? <laughs> best stars go. in that orbit. So yeah, so this I think is going in that direction. So in a short while, I think it's actually going to be visible over uh, here again. Ah, so it will okay. be. But but these, the Pi Glow here, this version, I've got it on a different time. Right, okay. Now our chat room is right on it. We've got uh, Eric Duckman who is saying, ah, no, 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 the, the ISS isn't moving that quickly. It's just we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, they always remind point. us. They always remind us that he we're the ones spinning. Point. Yeah, because we are, we are rotating on our mm -hmm. axis, and then the ISS is also most of the Most of the 17,500 speed, though, is it's, 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 it's falling, it is, right? it is, it's, yeah. it's falling around the Earth. Obviously, the Earth is spinning, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it, we're, we're spinning. It takes us a day, surprisingly, <laughs> <laughs> to spin around once. So that's what's that's why it uh, it traverses different parts of right. the globe every time it comes around. So it will be a different uh, distance from us um, at its closest point. 
each time. Now, we want to take a look at this hardware because um, our TD has been trying to focus on this table forever. I think yes. he's most interested by this. What, what am I looking at? Well, yeah, let me introduce you to what I've got over here. So there's, there's two different uh, display items here. This one is a custom light that was also a successful Kickstarter. Oh, wow. But what it did was just looked good as a representation of the ISS. Uh, now, the creator of this, um, we were just you know, looking at working together, and uh, initially he wanted to get one himself. And uh, so he modified the internal electronics of this mm. so that I could do a little bit of control. Cool. Uh, just basic control. So there's really two colored lamps in here. And that's what um, we have going on. Yeah, yeah that's my very... Uh, amazingly proud um, <laughs> and lovely breadboard that I put together there. And we all start with breadboard, so yeah. there's no shame here. So, uh, you know, I was just amazed at how these things could be added on. And there are just a couple of transistors. And this is connected into the Raspberry Pi. Yes. And here. there's just two of the control ports I use in the code because part of the code configuration is choosing what display device is attached. So I've just set it when you're using the ISS light that it will just flash GPIO pins 24 and 25. Um, and depending on which one I have uh, cabled in there, it'll either be the Earth or the space station. You can see it flashes every now and that's again. That's cool. That's so, actually so that's cool. one, And that's really, really simple. Um, and uh, you know, I, I've got to say that there's there's no guarantee that that this will be made available to the general public. Right. But uh, last I saw, but you could buy the lamp. it's one of those fun hacker things that you can do with it. Yes. So I think what this shows is that you can get the Raspberry Pi, have the code, and then you can you can build this. You can build whatever you want with it. Now, um, one one also this one over here. I, yeah. I really like this because this looks mm -hmm. did, so, oh, I don't more know. like what I would yes. want on my desk. So this one. Is uh, you put an LCD display on? Yeah, that's an Adafruit uh, 16 uh, character by two line uh, display. So an LCD. Shape. And this is an RGB one, so it, it can change color as well. But this gives a lot of information about the next pass of the space station and the current pass if it's now, happening in real time. With this, with the software, with the with the package that you downloaded, would it be possible to say give people azimuth information? Yes. In fact, this does do that. During an active pass, wow. it does tell you how high up it is and where in the so sky to look. So someone could actually take this and use it, a mobile, plug it into a mm -hmm. battery, because again, we know it doesn't need access to the internet mm -hmm. as long as it's, the software's running on it. And they could use it to know exactly where they need to point their telescope to get the, the best possible view of the ISS. They could do, and that's where I think what you were saying earlier about the power of the right. Raspberry Pi, right. it might not be sufficient to, to do that because the number of calculations that you'd need to do per second a lot to keep a telescope you know, aligned on the space station is quite a lot. But it could at least um, tell you where to look. Where, uh, yeah, where absolutely, to it would do that. And this one, it also has an additional display item sticking out of it. This is called a blink stick. Um, and that has the really bright uh, RGB LED that lights up. I can probably actually get on there and tell it to light up in a minute as well. But so, so there's two display devices um, plugged into the same unit there. And I'm also working on, I've got a couple of Blink Ones, which is another Kickstarter. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> All of these Kickstarter projects yeah. that is just a little USB LED as well. So uh, looking to get that supported and a lot of different display types as well. So, up. speaking of your Kickstarter, you were obviously successful. Congratulations on that, Thank too. You. you asked for 5000 you got seventeen six. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, you know, I've never done anything like this before. I came at it completely green. Um, and I just didn't know what to expect. What I tried to do was to look at what would be a minimum for me to be able to get all of the components mm -hmm. uh, with free shipping uh, so that you know the cost of putting a, a system together would be as low as I could make it. Yeah. Um, and, and what that was really all about was just trying to keep uh, um, so there was the, yeah so there was the the, the actual co the individual component costs right um, and when I when I went out there 
uh, I've sort of lost my train of thought here. That's cool. So, so that's I can still <laughs> buy one though if I, I missed the Kickstarter myself, unfortunately, but I can still buy one from your website? Correct? You can, yes, because I, uh, I haven't yet completed the order of all of the component parts. Ah, hear so, that chat room? <laughs> yeah, so you can still you can still purchase uh, purchase them right now. Cool. Um, and that the whole Kickstarter was just an amazing blast. Uh, you know, it doesn't just happen by putting a Kickstarter up there and then sitting yeah. back. Yeah. You know, there was a lot that went on behind the scenes of doing uh, Twitter, you know, a lot of Twitter right. posts, actually connecting with the astronomical blogging community. Oh, and wow. I had uh, a few people that were well known in that community that blogged about it stuff on Google Plus mm -hmm. and uh, you know things just things just sort of came together so Padre? yeah it went it yeah. went very well now Padre? Oh. I really want to see some code oh yeah I know I know I, that, 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 we, really we, we, we've been teasing our audience long enough now here's the thing I know that we we don't want to just hand your code out to everyone in fact that was one of the questions I, I'm, I'm, I mm. want to ask you I'll, I'll ask it later about how difficult it is to monetize something on a platform that everyone mm -hmm. just assumes is free. But yeah. first, I don't want to see all your code, but I would love to see segments of your code that you're particularly proud of. Is mm -hmm. there something that you figured out how to do that you think maybe our audience might be able to play with? Uh, yeah, I'm going to show you a bit of my spaghetti code right now. All right, now. let's so, go. I love spaghetti. Uh, and this was, uh, so there's an attribute of uh, the space station when it's coming over, that is its visual magnitude, how bright it is in the sky, ah. if it happens to be a pass when it might be visible. Not all passes oh, at night time okay. are visible. Right, because if it's passing over you in complete darkness with, with no angle to the sun, it's going to be black. <laughs> Correct. There's nothing off it. Yeah, so, but oftentimes if it's passing early in the morning before sunrise, just before sunrise, or in the evening, you know, within a few hours after sunset, uh, when it's going over, it's still visible to the sun, so it's up oh, there. Cool. Um, now, the 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 FM library did not have any function to figure out the visual magnitude right. of any satellite, so I had to figure out how that was done. Yeah. And uh, you know, I did the usual googling, and uh, various people came back with that's really difficult to do, yeah. and blah blah blah. And I just I just didn't want to give up, so all it came down to in the end was a bit of high school math. Really? You know, remember that algebra thing? Ugh, uh, don't remind so, me. So <laughs> you're, figuring, you're figuring out a triangle? Is that, is that yeah, okay. it was just crazy, crazy. So it is, uh, so what's going on here is I have, using the code that I've already got, the distance between you and the space station, oh. and I have the angle of it. So I know where it is. I have the distance between you and the sun. And then you figure out that And the third angle leg. to the sun. So I have those it's two geometry. and those two angles and I had to figure out this missing angle. Yeah. It's called the phase angle between you, the space station and the sun. Huh. And this is the code that does it. I, I wonder if I actually even left in. Anyway, I was just so amazed when I figured it out. There it's, you have it, uh, folks. You know, do you remember back in high school where your teacher told you that uh, trigonometry would save your life? Well, here it is. <laughs> All right, so, so now you've, you've figured this out, I mean, which automatically is fantastic, because I, I can imagine the people on Google saying, oh, that's really hard. Just Why do you want to do that? Because I can't figure it out. But mm -hmm. no, you persisted, and you figured out, wait a minute, there's a spatial thing here. If the mm -hmm. sun... If I can see the sun, and if the sun can see the ISS, then that means that I can see the sun bouncing off the ISS. Mm -hmm. How do you turn that into code? Into code, yeah. So that's really what I've got here. Gosh, how can I even this, uh, take you through what's here? Because it's math, and I've forgotten it all already. <laughs> um, but you can actually see some of the components in it uh, that I talked about here. So, And this um, is all in Python, by the way, yeah, right? Yeah, this is all in Python. So. Uh, there's a couple of things going on. This first thing, if ISS dot eclipsed. Now, ISS is an object that there actually is the current st status of the ISS. And uh, if it's eclipsed, it means it's actually eclipsed by the Earth's shadow. Correct. So it won't be visible. Mm -hmm. um, but then what I do is I, I have the sun and I compute the details for the sun and this will give me a whole load of data about the distance between me and the sun at that particular point and that's right. what we have going here so this is where i'm i'm uh, these are the equations a b and c 
you know, Whoa. that's that's okay. to do with the triangle. So distance to the sun, distance yeah. to the ISS, yeah. and then figuring out the angle right. between the two. Yeah, so what I've got here is A is the distance to the sun. So the sun dot earth distance is the distance between the earth and the sun times the astronomical unit, which is uh, to do with... Um, uh, yeah, how, right. how many kilometers right. it is to the sun minus the radius of the Earth. So because, you know, we're sitting up from the center of the mm -hmm. Earth, so I had to subtract that. I don't think it would have made a big difference. Uh, not, not you know, really, in, yeah, in the 93 million miles, whatever, it wouldn't have made a lot of difference. But you know what? We love the fact mm -hmm. that you thought about that. Yes, <laughs> there you go. And then uh, uh, the side B is the range to the ISS, and in this, uh, in the object here, it gives it in, I think, meters. So I divide it by a thousand to get it in kilometers. And then uh, there's this angle. You know, one of the angles that I have is the angle. It's to do with the at azimuth and altitude. So this is where you were saying this. This is where that data comes from. And so it's you're pulling from the ephemeral framework here. Yes, I got exactly. It. So it is just there. Um, and this is, so that does that. And then finally, I have this length C, which is that, remember that square root a, of yeah. a, 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 squared a squared plus, squared plus B, B squared, squared equals C squared. There, there, there it is, folks. <laughs> All right. there you, there's the proof. That's why you need to learn that. <laughs> Anyhow, but I just want to let you know, I did forget it all because I had to relearn right. it for this. So, but hey, at least, it, at, least I knew what, <laughs> I, at least I knew what I had forgotten. Absolutely. So, and then this wow. is where finally this last bit is the bit that I needed. The phase angle um, is uh, is all of this. Oh, look, it's pi day. It is pi day. Yeah, 3.14. Yeah, actually, there you go. Math we just pi. passed super pi, which was 3.1415. Oh. Uh, so, yes. Yes. Oops, we should have, we should have taken a, a, a moment for that. Now, I, I will say this. I, I love the fact that you're bringing this up because we just introduced objects and classes mm -hmm. to uh, our Coding 101 crew. Mm -hmm. And some people were a little confused by, wait, what, what's a class? What's the property? You were just showing us some mm -hmm. things. And if, if they were paying attention to the Coding 101 lessons, they should have been able to see that. And even though it's a completely different language, mm -hmm. they should have seen some of the similarities, some of the things that you can look at this and go, Oh, I see. I see an if statement there. I see the assignment of a variable. I see playing with a, a, the property of a class and of an object. This I see a return. These are all elements that recur in whatever programming language we're using. It just happens that this one is Python. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Wow. You're very welcome. And then the final piece just on here, the bit that I really came in here is the magnitude, the visual magnitude. And this is where I plug in my phase angle to this equation. That equation I didn't create. It was out there on the web on some site that oh. said this is how, as long as you have the phase angle, this is how you can figure out the visual magnitude. So you worked backwards. Uh, yep, exactly. You knew you needed the I phase angle? I often work backwards. And you said, how I've, can I find that? Yep, life, life just occurs better if you do it backwards. So the phase angle, is that the part that I see on the website when I'm using my own ISS above Raspberry Pi? Um, oh, the part you mean? That's negative 2.5. Yeah, no, so that's the magnitude. Magnitude. So okay. if I bring up uh, the web page here, so this is, this is the other thing that the Raspberry Pi yeah. has running on it. Okay. It has this web server on it using another uh, you know, installation that you can just download yourself. It's called, I, I want to pronounce it Flask, but it's probably <laughs> Flask. <laughs> You know what? Uh, I, Flosk sounds so much nicer. Let's do that. It does. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we use Flosk, but, get our website, and yeah, we go so, to the IP address. Mm -hmm. So and this is another Python uh, file called www.issabove.py. Okay. And it then gives all of this information. Um, so this, again, is coming directly from the Raspberry Pi itself. It doesn't have to go to any website to do it. It's got it right here. And this is where... You can see at 6.40 a.m. tomorrow, um, if you happen to be in uh, Petaluma or anywhere in mm -hmm. San Francisco area, you would be able to see 
a very bright international space station. Wow. Um, so uh, negative numbers mean it's brighter? Neg negative is better. Okay. Yes, in this case, it is better. So uh, if you go out and you happen to look up at the moment at nighttime, yeah. you'll see the brightest star above which, you. Which seems to be moving rather quickly. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, I, I don't know which one you're talking about. The one I'm talking about is, so not space station, the brightest star every night you look above you is the one that's not twinkling, and it is the planet Jupiter. Right. So it's almost directly up. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm bringing that up is that is approximately the same brightness as this. Oh, so, cool. so this is so the space station it can get a lot brighter than this as well. Wow. But uh, it's uh, it's a, it's a little bit uh, dimmer. I than remember Jupiter. I remember when the ISS first went up in its complete configuration. People were saying, "Oh, well, it's." It's now the brightest object in the sky. And I'm like, I, I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. But with this device, you can tell them when it will be true, when it will yes. be the brightest object mm -hmm. in the sky. Very true. That, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's, let's back off a little bit. I, I hope people have geeked out a little bit over that. I, I mean, I love that fact that you're so proud of that, <laughs> of that little piece of code, that, that function that calculates the angle and the phase. Fantastic, thank you so very much. Thank you. But let's talk a little bit to the people who might now think, oh, I'm gonna create a Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna grab the pie, and like Liam, I'm gonna figure out a problem, and I'm gonna hard code it in my pie, and it's gonna, it's gonna be wonderful. I alluded to this a little earlier, and that is the pie is considered a, a hacking tool. Mm -hmm. And typically the people who use the Raspberry Pi expect everything, everything to be free. I know that whenever I do my projects, I'm always doing, doing app get, and I'm downloading packages. Yeah. How difficult is it for you trying to monetize a product on the Pi when people mm -hmm. kind of expect, well, once I've got the code, I can just share it with anyone? It, it's, it's interesting, and that depends on who the audience is. I would, uh, I, I would, I'm pretty sure that most of the people who actually purchased, uh, backed the Kickstarter, who got the complete unit themselves, uh, that was where you know, it came with, the, with everything needed, just plug it in and go they're not the hacker type. So for them, this is something that allows them to just get something and, and right. work with it right away. So that's not the issue. But uh, I did provide a version of the code that is customized to your location and also set up so it tweets. And it's a custom image on the SD card. Oh. Now that, and, th and the cost of that, uh, you know, was on the Kickstarter $42. Oh. So, it, it, but it's, I've, I've got to admit, that sounds quite expensive. Um, in, it, this is what I was going through. It's like, yeah, how, how can I get beyond the, the question that is out there that this is all open source? Right. It really just speaks to what, you, what, what you're talking about. And I've got to say, I've, I've been a bit conflicted about it mm -hmm. because, yeah. you know, I've invested a lot of time in what I've got, what I've, what I've produced here so far. I've been there. And no. No. It, it, I'm still conflicted about yep. it. You know, at some point, exactly maybe it will just be, I'll just put it out there. Because I know, well, firstly, the code is available. When you get it, you can do whatever right. you want right. to it. Mm -hmm. And I've already had people on the beta program, you know, develop stuff for it. And, you know, we're just, I'm just not sure where it's going to go from there. There was even, I, there was even a, uh, a, on some of the, the boards, I think, Hacker Day, there was a, or on Reddit, someone said, why, would, why on earth would anyone pay $42? You can just do this yourself. I think it comes down to supporting something that you love. Mm. That's what it is for me. I'm, it might not be open source, but it's, I'm supporting a person that I love and I'm supporting mm -hmm. a project that I really think could get children inspired and get people really inspired in learning about astronomy yeah. and learning about code. So that's why I would purchase it. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you said it, and you sort of put aside the fact that, uh, oh, it's open source. One of the, the comments I had from Reddit was, well, um, my Raspberry Pi has been sitting gathering dust because mm -hmm. I couldn't find something that I wanted to use it for. And they saw this as a reason why they would, you know, get it out of its dusty box yeah. and a put, it, put it on it. So it, it can, you know, even if you are someone who's got a Raspberry Pi, you can now, this is what you can use it for. Yeah. 
Um, it's, it's the phenomenon so, of, of course mm -hmm. you could figure out how to do this. Of course you could mm -hmm. have, have busted this out and downloaded a bunch of packages and done a little bit of math, but someone actually did it. Yes. And if you, would, if you like what he did and if you want him to continue doing what he did, why not support him? I, I think that's that's Good really what point. We, and we we do that in content. I mean, mm -hmm. our content's free. You don't mm -hmm. have to do anything with our content. You don't have to do anything with our with the code that we create. But we offer it out there, and we hope that people like it enough that they'll feel compelled to support us. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That's about uh, about what we can say. Yep. And Shannon, I wanted to speak to what you brought up about this being something that inspires kids. Yeah. Because that that is that that was the point for this i had the vision i had was that i was just creating this for my grandkids oh uh, that's so cool <laughs> so and 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 when i was uh, initially just after i started you know messing with this and i took it to the san diego maker fair in december a very early versions of this i didn't know how well it was going to be mm -hmm. you know received there and it was when a young kid who was probably nine years old came up to me near the end of it and just sort of whispered to me and said, this is, this is the coolest thing here. Oh. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's really all the praise you can get. So cool. There's nothing better than that, right? I didn't need anything else. Good inside? <laughs> it, it really does, uh, because that is, that is what this is about for me. You know, I, I think there's an opportunity to inspire uh, people all around the world with this. You know, I've got one of these going to Beirut. Oh, wow. And the backer emailed me and, uh, and, and said, does, it, does the space station even come over here? I said, I don't <laughs> care because I just want to back this. <laughs> and, and of course, I, that is the point. There's no borders in space. Yeah. And this space station that's been manned for 13 years, built by 16 nations, has Russian wow. astronauts, cosmonauts, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> and American astronauts, while down below, you know, we're at odds politically right now. But hey, guys, they're just, they're just getting on with stuff. It's uh, just a model. It's a model. Get, it gives me chills just thinking mm -hmm. about it. That's just amazing. Uh, yeah. I love it. Liam, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, we, we, in fact, we've gone way over time but just because we've had so oh, much we fun. Have? We've been enjoying ourselves. What? I know. Go it? figure. It's, but, but I do want to give you some time to, to talk directly to the audience and mm -hmm. tell them what can we expect out of ISS Above. I mean, will you expand this project? Do you have another project coming? Where can they find you? Where can they find out about the work you do? Sure. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, you can go to my website issabove.com that has a lot of information about the current project and how you can also purchase one right now uh, only for the next couple of days because I've got to complete the order <laughs> um, but going forward from here I really want to create uh, some more custom versions of this uh, this works great in in the home and on a shelf but I really see this as being something that could be at the Exploratorium. Oh, yeah. Down in, uh, you know, any uh, planetarium. And for those, I, I, I want to create something that has a bigger type of interface. Mm -hmm. So something more like this, but possibly with an embedded LCD display nice. in it. Right, right. Um, so that's one aspect. The other thing is I've been... Politely, I'll call it. I've been hammered by the ham radio community. Oh, that worked! <laughs> I didn't need. I, I, that just sort of came came out. Uh, the ham radio community, because uh, the ISS uh, plus many other satellites up there do act as radio repeaters. Oh, so you can you can yeah. extend your range, but uh, even more exciting, you can occasionally speak to a real astronaut live. Wow. When I was at the San Diego Maker Fair, one of the ham radio guys came over and said, the other day I just be, happened to be listening on their band as they came over. No way. And they, and they said, hey, we need to, you know, they wanted to test something out. So he got talking to a Russian cosmonaut. I just started getting into ham radio <laughs> myself. I just bought an SDR and I've been playing with software to find radio. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. All you need is a directional <laughs> antenna and positioning yep. information. You know where to point. That's the thing. exactly it. And the, so that cool. version, I've already registered the domain. It's called Sat Above. Nice. Uh, and it's designed to track up to 16 satellites wow. from the selection of the appropriate ones that hams would be interested in. Ooh. So, so that's another another okay, little project. That. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> and, excited. and I'm going to get in ham as well. Okay, so maybe because I I just haven't got it, got into that oh. at all. So I can I'm sure that's where I'm going as well. 
Liam, mm -hmm. it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so very much for coming up. Thank you for, for speaking to our audience. And, and, and you know, the reason why we have this episode is because we want to show the, the coders out there, the future code warriors, code monkeys, what they can do with a couple of ideas, a little bit of hardware, and some hard, software knowledge. So again, thank you so very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you so much. This is my heaven to be in <laughs> uh, the brick house. Well, we Just, love having you. Thank you. And of course, as usual, you can always find all of our information over at twit.tv slash C101. That's our website where we have show notes and we'll have links to all of Liam's information on there. That's right. And if, uh, if you can, why not jump over to our Google Plus page, which is, I, be I believe, gplus.to slash twit coding 101. It, it's a growing community, and we will be supporting each other's projects. If, if you think that you want to hack something together with a Raspberry Pi and a little bit of Python knowledge, why not jump into the community and ask them how? Liam had to search Google. Well, why not just ask the people that we know are part of the Twit community? Again, that's gplus.to slash twit coding 101. And if you're watching live, live.twit.tv and irc.twit.tv. That's the IRC. So you can jump in in the chat room and ask us questions while we're doing the show live. It's That's right. very fun. Yeah. So definitely join us. Well, both of us were pulling from the chat room as, as this episode was going. Now, also, you can find us, if you don't do the whole Google social media thing, on Twitter. You can find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. <laughs> and I'm Snubs at Snubs. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas there. I'm Shannon Morris. End of line. How do you do that in Python? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>